for the whole month of August, I will be teaching the preview of uh, our lessons because you know that uh, Bing Alabada has been assigned to preach uh, for four Sabbaths throughout this month and he will be focusing on the conversion of Paul and uh, the characteristics of his uh, experience as it uh, may relate to ours. And we're happy that we uh, had that message this morning. And in fact, there were several people who really came out happy about the sermon that they heard. And they have been touched. And we can continue to have the experience as long as we follow the condition of receiving the power of God. And that is uh, depending on the Holy Spirit for Him to be able to touch the hearts of those who come in order to join us in our worship and listen to the messages coming from the Word of God. And so uh, assigned to me is lesson number six of the new quarter. And this is actually the burden of the general conference that so that uh, they appointed or still got uh, Pastor Finley to head uh, this program of promoting revival and reformation, making uh, us uh, aware of the present condition of the church and uh, developing that need in our hearts to really long for the coming of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that He can rule and reign in our Christian lives and thus experience the power that can only come from Him so that we will be able to witness and uh, what uh, bear fruits that will bring glory to God through a godly character and uh, ministries of witnessing and reaching out to people who need Jesus Christ. And so uh, I would like us to begin with a word of prayer. Shall we bow our heads? Our dear Heavenly Father, again we thank you for speaking to us. You continually reveal yourself to us and you even reveal our sinfulness so that we can be awakened to the fact of our helplessness and hopelessness. We cannot change ourselves. We cannot make ourselves good. We cannot achieve any uh, godly deed without first acknowledging that it's only by your grace that we can perform according to your will. And so, Father, we come confessing our sins and humbling our hearts. We need you. And again, through this lesson, May you speak to us so that we may better understand what it means to radically turn around and experience a moral transformation so that we can live sanctified and godly lives. Thank you, Father, for being with us and teaching us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, when you came out, you were able to see Brother Jess and Sister Teresa actually distributing copies of this souvenir program record of our celebration of our 30th church anniversary. Anybody of you who received? If you advertised, okay, you will find uh, your pictures somewhere towards the back of the souvenir program, and uh, you will receive a free copy because your advertisement fee is uh, already covering the price and cost of this one, and uh, excluding, by the way, not including the church directory as uh, announced by Sister Teresa. But uh, I'm using this as an illustration because I would like to read again the very message that I put on uh, this souvenir program. And I believe you will remember some of the parts that I actually wrote. I said here, Every delighting in worshiping God, it is our 30th church anniversary theme. Because how can we do otherwise? After three decades of existence, we now own a building and enjoy an active church life. We look back and see committed pioneers, self-sacrificing leaders, and faithful members. In the heavenly potter's hands, sinners became saints. Warriors became victories. Scars turned into stars. And the impossible became possible in spite of our faulty minds and sinful hearts. What a God we have and worthy is His name. Yes, in our celebration, we can remember the many great things that happened here because of God's presence, because of God's leading. But of course, we are not totally satisfied with what is occurring in our midst. 
after 30 years, how many families do we have in our membership? How many members do we still have? How about the rate of our baptism and disciple making? I believe we are not really satisfied. We should have gone home to our heavenly home a long, long time ago. Had we experienced the kind of revival that is actually expected of us by, by, by God. Remember Jesus Christ when he commanded his disciples to go and what? What's the word? Yeah, not baptize, but make disciples. Baptism is only part of that mission that Jesus Christ gave us. It is not the end of his mission, but to make disciples so that we can multiply, increase rapidly, can cover immediately a large area, which actually is the entire world. And it is a mission that is impossible. But at the end of his commission, he gave us a promise, making the impossible what? Possible. Because he said, I'm with you always. And God has already given me all authority in heaven and earth. So in other words, there's nothing to fear. We can fulfill the Lord's mission and we will be able to finish the work of letting everyone on this planet know about God and His plan of redemption. But we are not fully satisfied because we know that there is spiritual lethargy in our midst and we are not yet able to fulfill that after so many years since Jesus Christ gave that great commission. We are not experiencing the kind of Pentecost, the kind of Pentecostal experience that the early disciples had. And I uh, read some comments about a certain book, which was actually written by a theologian sociologist, saying that the early disciples were able to cover the then known world in such a rapid uh, time or short time and rapid pace that millions became uh, Christians, even to the writings of those who testified about some servants, some women, some kids, some children. Uh, almost everyone in the neighborhood, everyone in the household becoming Christians because of the testimonies of the Spirit-filled early disciples that belong to the early Christian church. Now, do we see this happening now? No, we don't. After a year, we report how many baptisms? Ten probably is the highest, even below. And many churches here in America, or Seventh-day Adventist churches, report that they are able to baptize only about one, two, three people within a year. Not mentioning even the people who go out of the church, the members that they lose. So in other words, we have that need. We have a problem. And we know that. And by the way, I remember the story of uh, Ron Pluzet who said that uh, one time because Southwestern uh, Adventist University was the first school that tied up with Share Him, the one that was developed, the program that was developed by Robert Falkenberg. Uh, he reported that they went to uh, Ghana and he brought along some of the brightest students from that Adventist University about 12 of them and they started preaching they started evangelizing and at the end of their series they were able to baptize about 900 souls wow and on the last sabbath of that campaign of which their campaign was just a part 25 pastors baptized around 3188 converts after that long campaign together with the other churches for six hours they were baptizing those who accepted the faith the, Adv the adventist faith but then after telling that story he realized that there was a problem in that uh, adventist community large community who actually participated in that evangelistic campaign or reaping campaign because one of the converts happened to be a former priestess or witch possessed by Satan. She froze, she became very stiff, and it took about six ministers to be able to submerge that individual 
uh, into the water and even with great prayer. It was only after much prayer and after much effort and much uh, struggle that that woman was immersed and was baptized. And, and of course, after the baptism, she was a free woman. Now, according to Ron Pluzet, he finally discovered that actually in that area, not only unbelievers believe in the power of of uh, Satan and evil spirits and not only were the unbelievers who go to priestesses and witches in order to ask for power and solutions to their problems he discovered that even Adventist Christians go to priestesses and witches at daytime they go there in order to receive miracles of healing but in the evening according to that priestess Pastors would go to her in order to inquire of how to have power that is supernatural, that will really change lives and make them prominent as administrators of power that is supernatural. Wow, even in Christian churches and even in Adventist churches, we have this evil existing. And so, what do we need? According to Ellen G. White from this book, which we distributed uh, several months ago, again, through the help of Mark Finley and his promotion, actually these are compilations or quotations from two of the important books of Ellen G. White. One is Steps to Christ and the other one is Selected Messages, Book 1. And this probably was designed to be not too thick because, uh, yeah, of course, the uh, publishers knew that our regular members will probably not bother reading a thick book on revival and reformation. And uh, they don't want their purpose to be defeated. So they tried to make this uh, issue as... Uh, as thin as possible and as small as possible so that members would not be intimidated to consulting this book by Ellen G. White. And I would like to read from the first uh, chapter, particularly the first paragraph, because within we find the expression of Ellen G. White's longing that we realize that we have a most urgent need that we have this greatest need that she calls, okay? That we are to exert much effort to be able to receive one particular thing that will bring change in our church. Okay, let me read it. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. Is it big buildings that we need, that we really need? No. More education, more degrees, more people who are able to earn PhDs or uh, doctorates or even masters on biblical studies, homiletics. Is that what we need? More tithes and offerings, more money, more resources, means of transportation, more facilities. Is that what we need? More printing of the Bibles. Of course, these are all important. But is that our most urgent need? According to Ellen White, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. Without which, all the things that I mentioned would be wasted and would have no effect on the kingdom of God in terms of having it propagated or having people invited so that they could can come in and receive the blessings of God. Okay? Let me read. To seek this should be our first work. There must be an earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow His blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. Wow! 
The mission impossible becomes possible because Jesus Christ received all authority and He promised He will be with us. His presence will never depart from us. Now, regarding revival and reformation, is it an impossible task? Is it an impossible experience to be experienced? Huh? Using our human efforts, we can never do it. We can never have it through our own earthly efforts. But because there is the power that is available, that is actually in the hands of God, and He is already extending His hand to us, already offering us that blessing and that power. The impossible task of experiencing and having revival and reformation in the church is no longer impossible. It's within reach, right? So the greater problem then, the greater problem then is not the difficulty or the impossibility of experiencing the revival because of lack of power. The greater problem is we are not willing to ask for it and even receive it. Wow! Can you imagine that? You can already have one million dollars, but the problem is, is you are not asking for it. It's already available. It's there. You don't have to live in poverty. You can have a large mansion. You can have many, many fast cars. You can enjoy luxury. The problem is, you probably do not realize your need for it, for the millions of dollars available. They are already there for you to ask. Just ask. Feel the need. Ask for it. And according to the writings of Mel Ellen G. White, God is more than willing to give us that blessing, the Holy Spirit, than an earthly father to give good things to his children. Can you imagine that? Where is the key to having revival and reformation? Where is it? It's just there. Is it available? It's available. Will be, shall we uh, be able to, to, to have it? Get it? Yes. But the problem is, we don't feel we need it and we do not ask for it. So actually, it is an easy problem. Or it is not an impossible problem. It is only a difficult problem because of our sinful human nature. Okay, according to uh, Ellen G. White's uh, paragraph again. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to them that ask Him than our earthly parents to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work. Ah, there's a condition. It is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us His blessing. A revival need be expected only in answer to prayer. Now question, why is it necessary for the Holy Spirit to come for us to be able to experience revival and reformation? Why? If we preach the word, if we expound to you, Galatians or Romans or Genesis or even the book of Acts. Will that not be enough? According to Ellen G. White. Okay? While the people are so destitute of God's Holy Spirit, they cannot appreciate the preaching of the Word. But when the Spirit's power touches their hearts, then the discourses given will not be without effect. Guided with the teachings of God's Word, with the manifestation of His Spirit, in the exercise of sound discretion, those who attend our meetings will gain a precious experience. And returning home, what will happen? You come to church, you listen to the preaching of the Word. Alright? You understand the Word. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are touched. Your feelings are affected. Your attitudes change, and then what will happen when you go home? Huh? 
returning home will be prepared to exert a healthful influence. That will bring change in our lifestyle, in our habits, in how we relate with other people, in how we witness, in how we are motivated to do good works that will glorify God's name and will make God known to people. The Holy Spirit is needed because all the efforts that we do, the printed materials, even the preaching and the teaching that we do, everything will come to naught, will be futile and useless without the power that will touch the hearts so that they will be transformed by the powerful Word of God. Amen? Okay, so now, there are conditions. And our lesson is now highlighting that part of revival that we are to expect and to want. Okay? The conditions of revival. I don't know why the word confession is put first before repentance. But later on, we will be able to see how these two are actually related. And if you look at the design of the title of your quarterly, you will find the word end is in italics probably to emphasize that both should come together just like two wings of a bird or two wings of a plane for it to be stable in its flight and be able to defend, uh, to reach its uh, destination. Okay? So, now I would like to re relate our present lesson to the first lesson that you studied regarding the need. And the one, and the one, being expounded in the first lesson was the Laodicean church, Revelation chapter 3, 14 to 16. Okay, so this is the first lesson and what we are previewing is the sixth lesson. But I would like to relate the two because now we are going to try to understand what repentance is. And as I put the two together, I thought I saw the various uh, characteristics that explain or that describe to us what repentance is for us to better understand how it works, why it will work, and what will be the end of uh, the repentance that we are going to talk about. So what do you have here are eight characteristics or sort of uh, aspects of description for you to fully comprehend and have a good understanding of repentance which is the main condition to having a revival and reformation okay so i put here revelation 3 14 to 21 and on the other side the characteristics and we will try to 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 find these characteristics in the message of jesus christ to the laodicean church as recorded by john the evangelist okay okay now get your Bibles and I would like you to open your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, 14 to 21. And for easy memory or even re reference, okay, let us use this outline. First, I would like to read the parts as we go through the outline. Okay, and I've chosen this because the word repent is found on the message of Jesus Christ, particularly to this uh, church called the Laodicea Church. All right, verse 14 is the introduction of the doctor. Okay, we're talking about sickness here what the solution or the drug is or the medication necessary for the disease to be healed, okay? So I'm using medical, uh, medical um, terms, okay? First is the doctor being introduced. Verse 14, these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Jesus Christ is presented as what? True witness, faithful witness. What else? Amen. Why amen? Because amen is a Hebrew word for truth. 
And it's very necessary that Jesus Christ be presented as somebody who's telling the truth because the nature of the problem of the Laodicean church pertains to not knowing the truth. Okay, so we have Jesus Christ, the doctor, and he is presented. Amen? Faithful and true witness. And not only that, he is in control. He has the authority. Why? Because he is the ruler of all creation. He knows every creature. And from him comes the life that is necessary for a creation or creature to live. Okay? He is a doctor who brings life. Okay? Then next, we go to 15 and 16. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Okay, this pertains to the diagnosis done by the doctor. According to the doctor, you are not well. <laughs> you are sick. You are neither cold nor hot. You are lukewarm. And something bad is going to happen. Because I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I cannot take you. You cannot be with me. I will have to separate myself from you. That's why I'm vomiting you out. I am throwing up. Okay? I'm expelling you from my body. So that is the diagnosis. You're not healthy. You're ill. And you are terminally ill. Okay? You are not uh, just suffering of a fever or a little headache or even toothache. You are terminally ill. Yes. You feel drowsy. <laughs> you feel sleepy. <laughs> but you might not be able to wake up. <laughs> okay. So that is the diagnosis. All right. The church is in bad, bad, poor, poor spiritual condition. The church is dying. Okay. So next is the description of uh, the disease. Let's read that. You say, I'm rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So in other words, we have here now a description of the disease. And the problem of the Laodicean church is it is a deceived church. There is deception that's happening because they thought they were wealthy. But the fact is they were poor. They thought they were able to see clearly but the fact is they were blind they thought they uh, were clothed with uh, what beautiful raiment but the truth is or the fact is you are naked so that is the deceased you are deceived you do not know your true condition so here i am the true witness telling you what your true spiritual condition is then you go to 18. What does it say? All right. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So how do we call it? There is the disease, the problem. What do you give? A person. Medication. Okay. Let's just uh, call it as drug. All right? Here is the drug that you need. This is what you have to take. Okay? Gold tried in the fire. What else? An eye salve. And lastly, a white robe. Okay? A white raiment. Only to be given by the doctor. You cannot uh, buy it from Walmart. Or anywhere else, you cannot find it in any pharmacy. You only have to go to the great doctor 
named Amen to and Faithful Witness for you to be able to get the solution to your terminal problem. Okay, drug. Then you have the next uh, text telling us that, of course, the drug has to be what? Even if the drug is very, very effective and very, very potent, if you do not drink it, <laughs> you're not going to be healed, right? Mm -hmm. So there is actually the appeal for the patient to drink the medication. Okay, Jesus Christ says here, uh, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If, that is the word if. What does it mean? Why is there an if? Huh? Why is there an if? Because Jesus Christ is not going to force himself or even his medication that you need on you. He will not force himself on you. He will, help, uh, he will uh, allow you to exercise your free will. He will try to persuade you, he will attract you, he will uh, convince you, he will convict you, but it will be up to you if you are going to take the drug or the prescription or not. And so there is the drink that is necessary. If you take this and you take it, something will happen because you will be healed, you will be treated, and you will go well and alive. All right? So what's the last part? 21. 21. After the drink. Uh, the destiny. 21. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. What is going to happen? To the Laodicean church? Should the church take the medication that Jesus Christ is prescribing them? Huh? Okay, this speaks about the destiny of the church. Those who overcame will sit with me. They will be overcomers. He, they will have the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Okay, how about the last part? Again, there is the decision to make. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, what's your decision? What is your decision? So, I am now showing you the, the parts of this uh, message of the loudest in church because we would like to relate it to repentance. And most of these ideas I got from uh, Mark Finley, but, that, but then these ideas I tried to test whether you can find it here in the Laodicean message. So that is now is our purpose. If uh, the description given by Mark Finley fits what we find in uh, the Lord's message to the Laodicean church. Number one, okay, repentance is described as something a spiritual experience that responds to God's initiative. Question, where do you find that part wherein Jesus Christ says, be zealous and repent? Where do you find it? Do you find it at the beginning? Or do you find it at the middle? Or you find it somewhere in the end of the message? Where do you find it? Huh? Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Where do you find that part? Somewhere in the end, right? Somewhere in the end. That's uh, here. Verse 20, 19 and 20. Somewhere here. Why here? At the end of the message. Okay. Because repentance is only a response.
to God's initiative. Jesus Christ sends the letter to the Laodicean church through John. And God here, or Jesus Christ here, is now introducing himself. I'm your doctor. You need me. I can help you. I got a power. And I know what your true condition is. So you better listen up. And I am here to tell you that you've got this problem. And you know what? I also have the solution for you. So here are the things that you need. If you will just follow me, something is going to happen. You will no longer suffer of this malady. You will be well and you will be good. Jesus Christ is taking the initiative to awaken the church of Laodicea so that they can be led to repentance. So there will be no repentance unless God takes the initiative. Amen? Is that clear? So in other words, repentance is actually a gift because repentance is never possible unless God comes in and tells you that this is your problem and I have the solution and I am offering the solution to you. Okay. Yes, uh, Brother Lavi? That's why the quark lesson is revival and reformation. Uh, I say, the Bible is not about you. Okay. Put initiative. The Bible is not about you. It is about God initiating to revive a person. Because you cannot revive yourself. Yes, okay. Passively, we are all dead. We are in sin, yes. Physically dead and spiritually dead. Mm -hmm. So the initiative is the Holy Spirit in the spiritual and CPR. Okay. Okay. Yes. And for you to be revived, huh? But for you to be, you must be given a new life. You are not physically dead. You are sick because uh, the condition is if you uh, revive, I'll keep in, you in my mouth. If not, I'll spit you out. Okay. But you are hopelessly sick. Okay. Sick. Yeah. That's it. Okay. And you are bound to die. Okay. Anyway. Uh, that is uh, how we see this uh, illustration that I'm now using based on the first lesson, which is about the message of Jesus Christ to Laodicea. And we find that the word repentance comes right uh, after the description of the doctor, the diagnosis, and the description of the disease. So it is only a response to the initiative of Jesus Christ as he revealed himself and as he revealed the true condition of the church and as he offered the, the solution that will uh, save or redeem them from that uh, despicable condition. Okay, next, number two, description from the lesson given to us by Mark Finley. Repentance is characterized with sorrow. And by the way, you can read also the text that support uh, the statements that we find on the board. The first one is Acts 5.31. We better open our Bibles and uh, check that out. Acts 5.31. This strengthens the statement that indeed the Bible teaches repentance is a gift from God. Okay, have you seen it? Have you found it? Okay, could you please read it, Adrian? Him God has exalted in His right hand to be Prince and Savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness to sin. Okay, Jesus Christ was exalted as Prince and Savior that He might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. All right, it doesn't come from us, it comes from God. Uh, of product of salvation? Will repentance be the product of salvation? <laughs> we know that everybody is forgiven, okay? No. Everybody. Not that I that, that repentance. Yeah, okay. Uh, I would, uh, unless I was saved, why would I mean, repent? So repentance would be something that since I'm saved, I realize that. Hmm, Look what God saved me from. I'm very thankful and I'm sorrowful. 
know. Salvation is for everybody. Salvation is for every sin. It can cover any iniquity, all right? And any failure, it is provided. I mean, forgiveness is provided. But it does not become a personal experience unless you receive it. And God helps you to receive it. Okay? If that is what you mean. <laughs> Salvation becomes a personal reality the moment you receive God's salvation God's gift that's the moment that you repent you because of the result the the uh, action will be God's salvation uh-huh so then you will be the reaction will be repentance okay so you're asking is repentance the result of an individual personal salvation is that what uh, you're saying Repentance is uh, <laughs> when you if you are in, if you are dead if you sorry for your sins then that's repentance it is acceptance of Jesus Christ as your personal savior that you will have salvation you will be saved from the second death okay when the word is preached you get convicted you become enlightened you become awakened to your sinfulness and to your need for the grace of God, right? And it is the work of the Holy Spirit to convict you of your sin. Mm -hmm. So, what is next? You understand the gospel, it is being offered to you. What do you do? Repent. But then the reason I repent is because God touched my heart. Yes. And, and this is all a result of. of, of you already quickened. Yes, you're yeah, made alive. For you to be able to receive and accept the gift but if you do not receive the gift what will happen you won't repent will you i you want what what true what is true repentance if you don't repent but you believe you will still be saved because the there is forgiveness but forgiveness becomes yours if you receive it that forgiveness and to, for you to be able to receive that forgiveness, you must realize that you are a sinner uh -huh. and you don't want to stay in uh, that uh, situation. So repentance is turning around, a, mor a moral radical uh, change, all right, for you to, to leave sin and be with, with God. So something already happened to you because you were quickened by the Word and you were quickened by the Holy Spirit. But the question is, are you already saved? That, that was the question. The question is that you just answered. You won't repent in, until you turn around. But that's it, the repentance. That's the repentance. Like in the example of Peter today. Mm. After he denied Jesus, he went out and he cried a lot. It says the Bible. And that was the start of this. Is the person who is quickened and convicted of his sin already righteous and justified? What do you think? The moment you are quickened, the moment you realize that you are a sinner, do you get uh, justified by God's grace that moment? Or there is a need for you to accept it. Okay. So anyway, let us not uh, debate on this. What we're just saying is it came from God. Yeah, I know the ordo salutis problem. That's an issue. Okay. And uh, we are somewhat. We justi the, the ungodly is justified. We're talking about justification by faith. You cannot be justified. When you're already godly, the Bible says the godly is justified. Therefore, the order of salute is that you're not regenerated and saved. You are saved from being unregenerated. Yeah. So I think the question, I think the question that there is, what comes first? Do you do you get saved first before you are born again? So in the general sense, you're talking about salvation in the general sense. Yeah, but, but ah. the Bible is always saying. You are what is those who are justified are the ungodly. So it, 
God doesn't justify the godly. The fact that you are moved by Him, you know, the predisposing grace of God, that does, 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 does not mean that you're already godly. You are moved so that you can respond to Christ. As soon as you respond to Jesus Christ by faith, then you are justified by God. So, in answer to Terry's question, uh, is repentance a consequence of salvation? No, I think repentance is a prerequisite of salvation. But repentance is a gift from God. <laughs> oh, you be at this side, but you say, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh -huh. Because even if a person repents, he remains ungodly. He has not done any good thing yet. He's not perfect, right? And yet he gets justified. Okay. Okay, anyway, let us not uh, dwell on that, okay? Let us just uh, stick uh, to what uh, our lesson is, say, is telling us. We cannot produce it. We, not, we cannot create it. It is not because of our own effort that we are able to experience repentance. It is God's gift. And it is characterized with sorrow. Okay. If we look again at this message to the Laodicean church. Okay. Do you think the Laodicean church was happy when they heard the, di the diagnosis of uh, Jesus Christ as its doctor? They heard the bad news. They thought they would be commended by God. But what they received was, hey, you're not good, you're sick. You're not wealthy, you're in poverty. You are not uh, well-dressed, but you are naked. That's bad news. And it produces what? Sorrow. Okay? If it was a good news, then there would be celebration and there would be joy. But repentance is characterized with sorrow because it is what? An acknowledgement of one's sinfulness. There is that element. We cannot repent unless we realize that we are in deep, Deep trouble. Okay. The, the question that Pastor Father went to what Terry is saying. If God this year is really proud and repentance is being sorrow, sorrowful for sin, how in the world can God this year be sorrowful for sin? You know, make it, let's apply it, make it practical. If, if you are proud, how can God make you sorrowful for your sin? You will never be sorrowful for your sin. If you are proud, you will not even admit that you're sinful. Now, what I'm saying is that the message of Jesus Christ was bad news. And bad news does not uh, result in joy. It results in sorrow. So we find in this message something that will disturb them, that will give them trouble, that will give them a headache. And that is the realization that they are naked, they are blind, and they are. So there is bad news, I mean. And that brings sorrow to the person who is sinful, who is a sinner, imperfect, and needs something to be changed. So the practical question remains. Yes, you give me the bad news that I'm sick of cancer. But I can deny it that I don't have cancer. And I can reject your prescription. What will make me take the prescription? I guess that's the question. There's a bad news that... The okay, uh, probably if we go over the other characteristics we will better understand the question what what I'm just saying is that here is the doctor who will make you sorrowful because the message is not good news it is bad news you are dying you are terminal you uh, will soon be uh, inexistent or non-existent okay so that's what I mean so uh, repentance will be of course characterized by sorrow because what you hear is not something good, not positive, it's negative, okay? Psalm 32, 3 and 4, what was the description of uh, David's experience as he described himself in Psalm 32? Okay, of course we know he committed a grievous sin against God. And that sin brought him trouble according to him when i kept silent my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long for day and night your hand was heavy upon me my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer to be in sin is not good and to know that you are 
sinning and in sin, it's not good because it will bring you sorrow. Okay? 2 Corinthians 7, 8, and 8 to 10. With my letter, I do not regret it. Okay. Now I did regret it, for I perceived that in the same epistle made you sorry, thou only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you were sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a god in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Okay, so we find here, Paul actually writing to the Corinthians, talking about their, uh, their pride, their arrogance, and their uh, not being able to accept his authority. So they had some... Uh, relational problems and of course he also talk about the sins that are happening inside the church this is already his second letter and uh, he knew that uh, his letters hurt people but that was uh, intended for them to be awakened from their sins from their lethargy so that they can mend their ways and become whole again in the face in, in the eyes of the Lord so there is sorrow in repentance because it includes realization of your sinfulness, which is really, really bad. Okay? What was the text again? That answers Terry's question. Mm -hmm. Did you hear that, Terry? Uh, Godly sorrow leads to salvation. Well, actually, the word leads not in there. What's, what's but the it's in italics. Well, what, what it just says, for godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation. Okay, it's still to salvation. It is still yeah. to salvation. It yes. pre precedes yeah. salvation. It's not after salvation. But, um, but then the question, I don't want to go into this, but... Uh, <laughs> the old salute is... Will you have godly sorrow? <laughs> will you have true godly sorrow if you're not saved? I mean, true repentance. Yes, you can, because God, God will move you to admit your diagnosis. That's my, my question. I do. The, you cannot sense your diagnosis. You will not be honest to confess if God doesn't move you first. Uh -huh. You got to make sure that you yeah. understand that you're wretched. But the fact that God makes you understand that you're wretched, that will lead you to godly sorrow, that will lead you to salvation. He does not save you in order so, for you to understand your wretchedness. Yeah, so so it's almost like God God had planned to save this guy, so He leads him to repentance, to salvation. Yes, but repentance still precedes salvation. Okay. It is not after salvation. It's not the result of I'm salvation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Number three. Repentance responds to God's initiative. Is characterized with sorrow. Feels sorrow for sin, and not consequences okay an example given in our lesson is the case of Esau he actually shed tears he became sorrowful but the question was was he able to get his birthright back was he able to receive the blessing from God because he already cried cried aloud he wept lamented everything he already did but did he receive the blessing that he wanted? Okay, not all sorrow, okay, leads to God's blessing. Because that sorrow was not true. His progeny was also blessed. Okay, let's not go into that. Uh, let's go to the text. Okay, let's go to the text. Okay, Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 16, 17. Hebrews 12, 16 and 17. Okay. Can somebody please read that? Yes. Oops. Who? Chris, Chris, Chris. Yeah. Lest there be any fornicator or propane, propane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance. Though he sought it diligently with tears. Mm -hmm. Though he sought it diligently with 
tears. He was remorseful. He was very sad. He cried and shed tears. And yet he was not able to get the blessing that he wanted. Why did he cry? Because of the consequences of his wrong, uh, foolish act. That he sold his uh, birthright for a, for a mere bowl of pottage, right? So not all, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> not, all, not every experience of sorrow is true repentance. This, there is a sorrow that does not reap the uh, expected. Uh, you mean to say, Pastor, is I, I did some mistake and I didn't realize it was a mistake and then I realized the consequences. You mean to say, if I cannot repent for it and ask forgiveness for it, I will still not be forgiven? Okay. Uh, are you repenting because you are sorrowful about the sin that you committed no. against God what or I'm because you are afraid of the consequences only? What I'm saying is only. I did not realize that it was a mistake. Now that there's a consequence now, I'm experiencing it. Yes, okay. Of course you're sorrowful. Yes. But you realize that it was sin against God. And so you confess your sin to God. If you are only sorrowful because of the consequences, then the Bible says it is not true repentance. It happened to Pharaoh. No, what the, what Pharaoh wanted to change his mind simply because there were plagues that are uh, destroying his own people. But he did not recognize God and he did not recognize that his wrongful acts were against the mighty God who would like his people to be uh, saved from slavery in Egypt. Another one, uh, Pharaoh, Esau, Judas. He probably was also remorseful, but it was false repentance. Why? Because he became afraid of the consequences of what he did. Not that he realized he was sinning against the true Messiah sent by God. No. What's the difference between compassion and repentance? Okay, we will go to that. We will go to that. Dito muna tayo, alright? Let us concentrate on this. Not only because of the consequences, but because you realize this is against God. The law of God, the authority of God, the word of God. You sin against Him. Okay? Now let us read that. Psalm, oh, Hebrews 12. Feel sorrow for sin. Oh. The next one. Now, the question is, what is the difference between confession and repentance? These two must come together and they are related. And simply, I say, repentance is the inner sorrow that you feel and decide to have a moral radical change, a radical moral change. Whereas confession is what? Outward expression of that repentance. You admit. You admit and say it you do not hide it you do not make excuses you do not put any blame on somebody else but you say you are the one at fault and you say it but the person can confess but can never repent <laughs> <laughs> is it possible to confess because it's outward yes probably it's happening outside in appearance you're able to show that you are confessing but inwardly nothing is actually the turning away. Turn, you know, <laughs> but confession does not necessarily mean that one person has repented because he can keep on doing the same thing, uh -huh. although keep on confessing, but still doing the same thing, there's no repentance. Okay, yeah, we're just saying that the easy distinction between the two is that the one is inner experience, the other one is outward experience, expression of what is going on inside. Repentance from a sinner. That's not just a confession. Okay, both. They should be together. Okay? Alright, next. View sin as bringing, no, breaking, sorry. Breaking God's heart. Okay, let us go back to the Laodicean message. First is about what will be the consequence should uh, 
Should the Laodicean church remain in, in being lukewarm? What is going to be the consequences? I am going to spit you out of my mouth. All right. Uh, do you feel sorrow that you are going to be spit out? Or do you feel sorrow because you are hurting Jesus Christ who is not feeling comfortable now with you inside his stomach? Because he did not spew me out. <laughs> I, have, I have still a chance okay. to, re, to, to change. Yeah. That's why he did not spew the charge out. Because that is his charge. Sometimes we only read that what is terrible about uh, the experience here is that you are going to be vomited out. That's the consequence of sin. What we don't realize is that you are bringing pain in the stomach of Jesus Christ. And you are making him dizzy, making him feel uncomfortable. There is ache that's in his tummy. And uh, yeah, right? It's not a wonderful experience to throw up. You don't like the feeling. You don't like the taste. You don't like the smell. But here Jesus Christ is suffering because you are inside his stomach and you are bringing him a lot of pain. Okay? So not merely uh, viewing sin. Oh wait, where is that? We, uh, repentance, through repentance, view sin as the breaking of God's heart. And we find it in Acts chapter 2, 37-38. We hear Peter actually preaching here. Yeah. And what did he say? Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brother, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, 237 and 38. When they heard this, were cut to the heart, said to Peter and the other Sabbath brothers, What shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized. What did they hear? What did they hear? That their hearts were pricked. Huh? What was their sin? Okay, they crucified Jesus Christ. Realizing that sinning, is crucifying Jesus Christ, murdering the Son of God, and hurting the heart of the Father. It's a person that we are bringing pain to whenever we commit the Lord's uh, transgression of the Lord's uh, will and instructions or law. Okay? So true repentance leads not only to... Depression leads not to depression, sorry. We already read its text in 2 Corinthians 7, 10. But to salvation. Okay. Jesus Christ declared the diagnosis. It was not good. The result was bad. There is a disease that is terminal. Question. Why did Jesus Christ reveal the true condition of Laodicea. He could have uh, kept himself, uh, what? Mom. He could have uh, been mom about it, did not reveal it. Why did he do that? Leads not to depression, but to salvation. Uh, I, I, I'm using the lesson written by Mark Finlay, and that is his very words. Mm -hmm. Because the Bible says okay. the world death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is taken from the lesson and I'm trying to uh, compare it with what we see on the message of Jesus Christ to the Laodicean church. Meaning when you repent or when you experience repentance, uh, you should not keep on blaming yourself and be depressed and feel hopeless. Okay? Repentance is to lead us to salvation, not to becoming depressed and becoming hopeless. About here, Jesus Christ revealed to us our true condition, 
For the purpose of what? For us to buy pure gold from Him, purified by fire. For us to be able to cover our nakedness with the robe that He is providing. And also for us to apply the eyesal that He is now offering to us. That we may be able to see the things around us and know our own true condition. Okay? That is the purpose. For us not to remain blind. For us not to remain naked. For us not to remain in poverty. That is the purpose. Next, number six. Repentance is marked by confession. Alright, we do not see this in uh, the message to the Laodicea because the only word we find there is repent. He did not say be zealous and repent and confess. But as I told you, there is a close relationship between repentance and confession because confession is merely what? A verbalized expression of repentance that is going on within you. Okay, next. Number seven. Leads. Baano ba ito? <laughs> Leads to forsaking. Okay. Of sins. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is not what Jonathan Edwards preached, the controversial subject that the sinner in the hand of God. Angry God. Oh, angry. Now, according to, Ro to Romans, to Paul, the goodness, not the cruelty, the goodness of God leads me, yeah. leads us. Yes, okay. To repentance, because we come short of what goodness He has done to us. Okay. So when I ask, what's the difference between compassion and repentance? Very, very simple, very clear. Compassion, you say what you did. And repentance is a stop. You know the woman in the well? He said, go and sin no more. No more. Yeah, okay. Stop what you are doing. Mm -hmm. So repentance is a stop to doing what is wrong okay yeah that's right okay if you go back to this message we find jesus christ as a beautiful person okay he is the ruler of our creation he created us all he is the one giving us all the blessings and he is not deceiving us he is telling us the truth now do you want him to have a stomach ache or even uh, discomfort Continue to uh, bring him discomfort? Of course not. We like him. We don't want to break his heart. We, we, we learn to love him because he is beautiful. And he is a magnificent lover. So we will stop bringing him pain. Alright? So when we repent, when he said repent, please stop bringing me pain. Okay? Next is number eight concludes by letting Christ to come in. So you see, actually, this is all about relationship with Jesus Christ. Can you imagine Jesus Christ outside the church? He said, I stand at the door. When you say stand at the door, he is actually holding his ground and he is patient enough to wait. That's why one time, I think it was at WMC that I told them, it's actually possible that we do our hour of worship with great vigor, with shouting and even praises, we can have our Bible study very dynamic and there is interaction and we can say that we have memorized even the memory verse of our lesson. Lots of good things that we are doing. But actually, it doesn't mean that Jesus Christ is here. He can actually be outside our church. And these are all just what? Outward. Appearance, forms, even with zealousness, okay? Because this happened to Laodicea. Jesus Christ is standing outside and appealing, knocking for us to open the door. It can be individual, it can be the entire church, and he is asking for a fellowship, a communion. That's why the solution is letting Jesus Christ come in and dwell in your dwelling place or you dwelling in him because according to him I will eat with him sup with him there will be fellowship there will be reconciliation 
and there will be uh, what? A friendship with Jesus Christ. So repentance should lead to the person and that person who, with whom we want to have communion and fellowship. That is the invitation. That is true repentance. Okay, not just forsaking sins. Because whenever we think of sins, we think of what? Things, sometimes abstract, sometimes concrete. Sometimes sinful thoughts, actions, and words. But the truth is, it's all about coming to Jesus Christ as a person, having a relationship with Him, and enjoying His fellowship. That is repentance. We are touched because here is somebody we love who got separated from us, but who has done a lot of good things to us and for us, and yet we abandon Him. Why not come back and receive Him again? That should be the motivation for true repentance. Okay? So more or less, what I say is that when I studied the, this uh, lesson written by Mark Finley, I found that they indeed, they indeed are uh, components that we see even in the study of the message of Jesus Christ of Laodicea. Probably that will be a help for us to uh, be able to remember especially these statements that describe true repentance that will bring salvation and revival to us. Any question? You mentioned uh, Elder Finley. Yeah, he is talking about true repentance. I can tell you a story like this. He said he went to the, to the church and said, Papa, I want to I wanna confess. What do you want to confess? I is still a rope. Oh, good. Now, that's not too bad. So there. But he did not say, at the end of the rope, there is a carabao. Uh -huh. <laughs> so he just say, I still a rope. Uh -huh. <laughs> that, is that a true repentance? No. <laughs> he did not confess the whole thing. It must be, according to the a total. it must be specific what you are repenting. And must be total. <laughs> yeah. My question, my pastor, is, is the diagnosis of the early, of the early son church is complete. Pardon, pardon. Complete diagnosis. Oh, complete diagnosis. Okay. Yeah. The situation of the recent church. And also the answer or the uh, cure for the diagnosis is was also given a complete, complete right. one. Complete, right. For every problem, there was, a, there was an answer. The question is, how come we are still lingering on such problem that we have up to now? Because revival has been has been the discussion of uh, our corporate church for how many how many years uh -huh. since, since, since just time even, I don't know, actually it was difficult for love this year to probably yeah, accept that's, that's, that's the question there. a spiritual because condition and therefore the need for different, uh, mm. ideas or something Richard, let's look at the know. historical view okay love this year is a place where people go there to get healed there's a lot of hot springs in there. Doctors converse there, and sick patients converse in Laodicea. Mm -hmm. Same thing now. Same thing, okay. In modern society now, United States, the big problem we have health problems, right? Mm -hmm. The church is also sick. The country is also sick. It needs a doctor. It needs healing, revival. Yep. Because the church or the Christian church as a whole, whether Protestant, Catholic, Baptist, Adventist, they're all diminishing the number of mm. adherents. And they all come to the conclusion that they need healing. Okay. They need to be revived. Yeah, yeah. The cure is there. So, so the cure what is, is there. So, so what, is your, yeah. what is your answer to his question? The cure is there already. Right? Yeah, the, our problem is we are satisfied with our present condition. Do we feel really dissatisfied with what we see around? Coming to church late? Not even really, st really studying the, the scriptures? Not hungering for? That's one extreme. The other extreme is you try to generate the revival on your own. Yeah, I think that that's the biggest the biggest problem of the approach of the church. There's a worldwide a global call for revival, and they think we can engineer that revival through strategy. Uh -huh. Revival, we can read that lesson. Revival does not come through human effort. 
prayer. It can only come from God through the Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I challenge you when you go back, uh, listen to Jim Simbala's sermon on prayer. You, you you will come out changed. He just said, you know, his background. He was he's not a, an excellent theologian. He wasn't a smart guy, but he knew how to pray. And they pray. The difference of Brooklyn Tabernacle is they spend time in prayer, admitting that they cannot do it. Only God can do it. Uh, I think that's one of the answers. I mean, we we asked what two weeks ago. We asked what in the world are we doing as a church? We've been here for over 30 years. We've been talking about missions. We haven't gone out. And so you know, we got beautiful cars in the driveway. We got doctors and nurses, but nobody is scared to organize a mission initiative from the church. For over 30 years, we celebrate our anniversary. What's going on? Oh, we can try to come up with a mission project, but it can be external. But if you allow, you know, but I'll go out on the limb until this church value prayer more and more people learn to pray and gather together for prayer. We might have mm. I mean, we, we can study as much as we want till we're blowing the face. But if, if, if people take prayer for granted and we don't even care about praying, oh, if revival's gonna come. It's only through the prayer of God's people that the Spirit can work and revival can come. I, mean, I might be stepping on toes again, but, but that's the reality. Okay, we, we yes, sir. We can invent revival. We gotta <laughs> ask God to give us revival. We have discussed that thing, and uh, it's always a question. And we are, we are uh, okay. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, Ellen White that says that you don't uh, just because you're not a good speaker, just because you're not a good preacher, then uh, you're not going to do these things, and you're going to because there is always somebody who's better than you. We're discussing that, but what Ellen uh, uh, Ellen White was saying is. You don't have to be like that because it's of one of us have different abilities. We are given abilities, so whatever abilities you use, don't wait. You use it. You don't have to be known to uh, to to say to preach to hundreds or thousands of people. Yeah, that's right. Okay. One, or a witness to somebody or around the world. So I, I was always thinking about that. So do I have to do these things? Do I have to do these things just just to make a difference? Then I, I was reading that. So whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, you're doing the best you can. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not witnessing. You may not know that you're witnessing, but actually you're witnessing around people around you. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that's, that's how I understand those. Everyone is an evangelist. Everyone is a minister. Everyone is a, uh, what's this? A worker in the field of God, according to the abilities that you are given. You may not be a pastor like myself. You can just be a doctor who uh, tells other people of God's uh, grace and goodness, right? So the magnitude or the size of uh, programs and activities that we do may vary, and even the methods or approaches may be different, but we are all God's witnesses to others. But back, back to this question. I heard a simple question of a teenager. I, I will not tell it. He said, it, it came out like this. Why do we have to celebrate birthdays? He said, why? Oh, because you want to you want to show you care for all this. He said, why don't why can't we just do that every day? Why can't we just show our care every day? And not mm. just on birthdays and all those things. That was his question. Oh yeah. That's a very good question. <laughs> and probably That's we should a very intelligent but, uh, question. There yeah, I, I was, I was kind of, kind of, there was a short and long answer, but I did not answer it because I said, let me think about it. You know, this morning, that's why I was very happy when I listened to Samantha Sagrada, because they are propagating a lifestyle wherein we do random acts of kindness. Okay, probably we do at first intentionally, but once it becomes a habit, it becomes a, a natural part of our lives. Wherever we go, we're able to do little things, good things. For them to feel the love of God and experience God's grace. Yeah, I, I don't want to pour cold water in that, but you can do rascals. The rascals was that random act of senseless kindness, okay? The rascals mm -hmm. are those who do it. That had a secular origin. It had no Christian origin. It just just being you know, paying for the toll of the guy next to you. Because you can still do these externals without being really revived. Mm -hmm. We don't answer Rufus' question. I think Everybody in the church, we have been talking about this for years, know that everybody's a minister. Everybody can do their thing. But why are we not doing it? I guess that's the question. Because, because we are not revived. 
how do we get revived? By working on the revival? No, of course or not. praying to God mm -hmm. to revive us and get the power of God, expressing how dependent we are in. I'm telling you maybe, uh, stepping on the limb, maybe because we're so proud as a people. We think we know everything, we got all the resources, we don't depend on God more. That's why we're not doing things for Him. No, it's because man is busy doing something else. We don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> huh? That's a problem of Laodicea. Self-satisfied, thinking that everything that... No, you're proud. You really don't care about God. You, you, you yeah, care more about you yourself. Yeah. Yeah, you but don't you care about God. But you haven't answered Rufus' question. Rufus' question is, how will you begin to start caring for God? Because if you don't answer the question, this lesson study is useless, right? Revival, this, the whole quarter will be useless if you don't find revival. That's right, that's right. But you cannot self-engineer that. And my suggestion is, if we as a people will learn to pray to God more and admit how useless we are, how hypocritical and proud we are, and we submit more to God and allow God to work in our lives, maybe that's going to change some stuff. I mean, maybe it's time for us as a church to recognize that we're really proud. We're high strung. We think we have everything that we have. Look at our parking lot. Look at our, you know, all of our te mm -hmm. technical equipment. Instead of looking at that, look at our, our depravity. <laughs> as a church, we haven't really done things that we should do for you. Lord, give us a heart for others. Give us a heart for you. Lord, we're sinners. I mean, if, if you think your appointments for prayer meeting is more important than kneeling down with the church to pray together to God, how do you expect a revival in the church? Yeah. When you got like, if you got 20 people in a prayer meeting, why, why Brooklyn Tabernacle has proven that? You know, the most number of attendance they have is during prayer meeting, Tuesday night. Over mm. a thousand people pray for almost three hours. And you, and you wonder why we're pumped up and we're so powerful as a church. It's not because of us, because God works in us. And I'm saying until we as a, as a congregation believe that it is only to praying to God and admitting how, how unqualified we are, that God can start working in us. And then I okay. think that's, that's the answer there, Ruth. Well, maybe we haven't really prayed enough and humbled ourselves before God. You know, mm -hmm. It's all about repentance and confession. Have it really been have really confessed of our inadequacies, our pride, have we repented of our stuck-upness as a people and depended really on God? Maybe when that happens, revival will come. And the kind of prayer that Bing is actually saying is something that is real because here in this church we can actually design or structure a program of prayer every day, this hour, and even for weeks of prayer but still will not experience a revival if it just becomes a program. It's going to become again human accomplishment, human effort. There must be real need and it's only God who can show us our real need. So people who really connect uh, with God better pray for, for, for the rest of the church. We need you so that we, uh, we will all be awakened. Okay? This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you very much. I don't want to pour a cold water in the 777. Have you heard of the 777? Seven days a week at 7 o'clock, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I heard it. Uh, you, this is part of the revival. Yeah, that's another strategy. I'm not saying Stray, it won't yeah. work. But if you just stick, if you only pray 777, you don't pray without ceasing, right? <laughs> and the, the, value, the, prayer, the value of prayer, the meaning of prayer can be gone because it's just external. My suggestion is, if each one of us starting here, mm. people outside, right now here, Look for somebody you can pray for yeah. within the week. Just look for, not even two, just one person you can okay. pray for. And go to the person and promise that individual, if you have a real need, I will pray for you. I'll mention you in my prayers every day. Yeah. I'm telling you that's going to revolutionize your life. Start yeah. with that. Start with that. that, that, that yes. That yeah. Don't wait for a program. Don't wait for uh, instruction from the pastor. Huh? Just do it. Okay. Let's uh, have a word of prayer. Uh, Bing, please. Father, thank you for this time. We can preview the lesson. We see the value of confession and repentance and revival. And yet, to a certain extent, confession and repentance can only be possible if you give us the power to confess. Amen. To enable us. Teach us to understand how frail we are and how, how unqualified, how inadequate we are. Teach us to depend on you. Lord, teach us to be humble. Teach us to, to confess our total dependence on you. And as we've said, maybe the way to start it is to demonstrate how we can be dependent on you by approaching a brother or sister or anyone in this church who, 
who might need us to lift them up to you to experience your grace. Lead us to a person this week and maybe that experience can blossom into a true revival in our spiritual life and we can be more intimate with you as you have invited us to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.